Welcome. I'm Shana Schacht, Outreach Manager at PSS Health Care. And we have Debbie Wozenfeld from the one Wano Fatal Law. And we have Lori Lewis from the Brooklyn Bowl President Office. She's gonna quickly do a quick um welcome to, for us tonight. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Lewis. I'm the head of strategic alliances and programs for Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. I'd just like to welcome all of you to today's uh, second session in our Wellness Wednesday series. Um, this session is on elder law, and uh, we are so glad to partner with PSS and uh, Debbie and everyone from uh, the, the law firm that's uh, providing this information. Um, we also just, it's been a busy day for Borough Hall. Um, this morning, we had our Black History Month clergy event, which was attended by over 200 people. This afternoon, we have this series, and tonight at 6 p.m., we have our Black History Month celebration, which is called uh, You Marched, Now What? So if you want to join that event this evening, you can go to our website. Sorry about that. Our website, brooklyn-usa.org, and you can register for that event tonight. Um, also, this series is going to continue all the way through April. Um, we have our next one on mindfulness and meditation. That's on March 3rd. And then on March 10th, we have COVID-19 and caregiving. March 17th, the Healthy Brain and Aging presentation. The Dementia Raw presentation on March 24th. And then on March 31st, Understanding Dementia. And we're planning to add a new one to this series. Is, uh, the first Wednesday in April, which is actually April 1st, April Fool's Day, we're going to do something on scamming and, and scamming for um, how it affects seniors. So again, we're happy to partner with PSS. Thank you all so much. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lori. And thank you again, everybody. Um, if you have any question, you can add it in the Q&A box or you can use the chat. So Debbie will answer most of the question at the end. So if you have additional question, you can also reach out to me and I'll follow up with you. Again, thank you. And with, without further ado, Debbie, you can start your presentation. I'm gonna stop the share now. Okay. All right, hello everybody. Um, uh, it's good, well, it's not really good to see you because I really can't see you. Um, um, because we're gonna have uh, slides that I'm gonna be referring to, but I do have to say, it's really um, a tremendous pleasure of mine and an honor uh, to be working in conjunction with Circle of Care. I think I've spoken once before for your group and also working with the Office of the Brooklyn Borough President. And um, I'm just really, really delighted uh, to be here and um, happy to share my information uh, before uh, we had started, uh, Shana, who had organized this, just thanked us uh, for coming. And I, in turn, just thanked her because I really, what I do, I, I believe I'm an elder law attorney. I've been practicing for close to 30 years. I've been working with Ron Fatula for, um, I've been working with Ron Fatula for 17 years. And I really believe in what I do. I am a lawyer. and. Um, although people often think of law as this uh, lucrative, uh, ambulance chasing type of career, uh, that is the furthest thing from what we do. We really, really, there's a strong component of, L of social work involved. And I really feel that we help people, we try to help people. And therefore, I'm very, very happy to be here. I feel honored and going to try to convey over whatever I can today, um, try to be as clear as possible, and also try to cover as much grounds as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to start. Um, and basically, uh, the first thing when we talk to people about what we do and uh, the importance of elder law, one of the things I want to note briefly is it's important to have a team. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and hire six or seven uh, professionals to do uh, work for you. But there are a number of different service providers. And when we come together, we all uh, provide a piece of the of the puzzle or a piece of the pie. And I find when people do have uh, other uh, professionals on board, the whole plan goes so much better. Um, number one, you have the attorney, that's somebody like myself who's familiar 
with estate planning. Um, estate planning is essentially helping somebody determine how their assets get distributed after they die, but, and it involves a lot of document preparation. Sometimes tax planning is involved, but a component of estate planning is this elder care planning that it's, it's a fairly new um, area of the law, when I say new, probably in existence for the past 30 to 35 years. And, and that is new. Uh, you know, people like corporate lawyers and real estate lawyers have been practicing for well over 100 years. Uh, we try to preserve a person's assets in light of the future or current uh, potential cost of long term care. And what's happened is people have realized that you can save and save and work very, very hard all your lives. But all of a sudden, you're hit with a, cat a catastrophic medical cost. And all of that savings could go uh, could go towards that care in a very short period of time. So that's what we try to do. We try to help preserve a person's assets in light of this potential catastrophic, uh, abysmal cost of care. Um, and together with the elder law attorney, often people use financial planners, financial advisors to help uh, figure out what can be saved, what money is actually needed to live on, how much income do I have, um, how much principle do I need in order to generate uh, the kind of money I need to pay for my expenses. Uh, very often, we also work together in conjunction with an accountant, a CPA, who's familiar with the person's assets, familiar with um, what kind of tax implications there are from doing certain planning. And so obviously, working in conjunction with somebody's CPA is extremely helpful to us. And finally, also a fairly new um, profession is uh, somebody called it a geriatric it is a component of social work where they're able to assess the person, able to come up with different options in terms of uh, various, uh, either whether it's home care or nursing home care, and they're able to coordinate and provide these services together with uh, the other uh, professionals who are on the team. Okay, Jackie, if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, when, we, when we do estate planning for a person, we come up typically with five important documents that the person should have. And when we do this, the nicest thing is when the person leaves our, ass, our, our office after they've signed everything, they pretty ha much have a comprehensive plan, which is going to help them both currently because they have peace of mind knowing that these things are taken care of, but also um, these documents are also available so that if there is an emergency, we can move forward. Uh, and the first document is a last will and testament. And that's basically a document where you, as I said earlier, you basically write um, how you want your assets distributed after you pass away, right? That's typically done in a will. And the will has zero bearing while you're alive, other than to give you peace of mind that you've taken care of it. Um, but it only goes into effect when you, in fact, die. And furthermore, it only covers what is in a person's name alone when they die. This is something that I stress over and over again. So for example, I, Debbie Rosenfeld, if I own a bank account together with my son, Josh, and I pass away, my will is irrelevant. Even if my will leaves everything to the Red Cross, that particular bank account is not under the purview of my will for the reason being that when I die, I have a joint owner on the account and that account passes to my son, Josh, and my will is irrelevant. Uh, similarly, even if I don't have a joint owner in my, on my account, if I have a named beneficiary, so people talk about in trust for accounts or um, FBO accounts for the benefit of, those accounts, again, do not come under the purview of my will, because they have a name beneficiary, which means the asset automatically passes to that beneficiary. Now, this might be basic to some of you, but many people don't realize that. So if, for example, all I own is a bank account and a house, and my house has a joint owner on it, meaning there's a joint name on the deed, and my bank account has an entrust for a certain child, my will is not as relevant I always encourage my clients to have a will anyway, because you never know. 
might you might come into more assets and the will would then designate how these assets are distributed. But again, if all your assets are owned jointly or have a named beneficiary, the will will not be relevant when you die, will not be utilized. Um, so that's one document. A second document is something called a power of attorney and statutory gifts rider. Now, I would say that that is the most important document to have, and I'll explain why. Unlike a will, a power of attorney is only relevant while a person is alive, and it's essentially a document that's utilized if someone becomes incapacitated. So again, obviously, God forbid, but if I were to become incapacitated and I have a power of attorney, my power of attorney dictates who can step in and sign on my behalf with respect to financial matters. Um, and the reason why, uh, the reason why that I think a power of attorney is more important than a will, first of all, when your will goes into effect, you're no longer alive. Power of attorney is relevant while you're alive. You're alive, but you're incapacitated. So you can't sign on your behalf. You can't do planning for yourself. The hope, of course, is that you've done this planning beforehand, but what if you haven't? Power of attorney in a, a crisis would enable a relative or a loved one, a spouse, a child, whoever you designate, to do any planning, even if it's emergency planning. There are things we can do in the last, you know, in the 11th hour to help someone protect their assets. The document after a power of attorney is a healthcare proxy. Again, Healthcare proxy is only relevant while you're alive, right? When you die, obviously a person doesn't have to be designated to make healthcare decisions for somebody who is deceased. So it's only relevant while you're alive. And it only steps in again, if you've become incapacitated and you can't make medical decisions for yourself, you're designating somebody to make those decisions. So I wanna stop here and point out, power of attorney, I just finished saying it's the most important document. Um, it's not that I think somebody's money and finances is more important than their health, but if somebody doesn't have a healthcare proxy, there is a law in effect, the healthcare, the Family Healthcare Decisions Act, which will allow a family member. There's, there's a basically, it's a tiered um, uh, order of who can act on somebody's behalf when they become incapacitated. So if I become ill and I can't make decisions for myself, even if I don't have a healthcare proxy, my family member can step in and there's an order of priority, but there's no such thing in the financial realm. If I have assets in my name and I need to do planning or planning has to be done on my behalf and I'm incapacitated, if I have no power of attorney, there, there's no law that allows somebody to step in on my behalf as there is in the healthcare arena. The only choice my family member would have in that case is to go for guardianship. So that's why I mentioned that power of attorney is in fact more important in my opinion. Um, so power of attorney, healthcare proxy, remember healthcare proxy, the sole purpose is to appoint somebody to make medical decisions for you if you become incapacitated. The living will, nothing to do with the last will and testament, the living will actually articu articulates what a person's end of life wishes are. The presumption under the law is that the healthcare proxy actually, um, the healthcare agent, I'm sorry, knows the person's wishes, but at least they have a roadmap that because those wishes are articulated in a living will. Okay, and the final document is a living trust, which I will get to, I will explain in more detail um, in further, when we get to further slides. Um, thank you, Jackie. Okay, so, but I will go into details on the living trust. Just to go over briefly the last will and testament, um, I do wanna say that uh, thankfully, I, so far, I'm here, COVID-19, I was not one of its victims, um, but I can't tell you how, you know, I have lectured for years on the importance of documents. Um, I think that COVID-19, um, I shouldn't say I think, I know that COVID-19 really hit home for many, many estate planners because in the very beginning, and it's continued until uh, today, unfortunately, it's still going on, but last March, um, 
unfortunately, uh, people were dying uh, very quickly. Uh, people were falling ill. And for the first time, hospitals were closed to loved ones. Um, nursing homes were closed to what loved ones. And our office was essentially, um, uh, Ron had closed, Ron Fatula, my boss had uh, a closed the office and we were all working from home and desperately trying to help people that were in desperate situations. So, you know, all the time, I'm constantly uh, lecturing about how important it is to plan ahead and to have all of these documents in place. And for the first time, I was really hit with such a, a palpable feeling of how important and in fact, it, in, in fact it is because it was very hard for us to help people who were sick in the hospital, who did not have access to social workers who were willing to Zoom with us or to have meetings with us. We, our hands were literally tied in some situations and in situations where people had these documents already in place. Again, our planning didn't necessarily save lives, but our planning really helped ease uh, the concerns and the worries for some people who whose loved ones were in the hospital, were in nursing homes, and because they had these papers already in place, it wasn't an extra added worry um, for those people who didn't have it. We tried our best, but it was really, really hard. Um, again, last will and testament is an important document. I will say this. Um, I just want to explain some of the terminology. The testator is the person who basically drafts the document. The executor is the person who carries out the testator's wishes. And the beneficiaries are the people who are going to ultimately inherit once the testator passes away. Now, there are certain situations where a will is fine, right? Mother leaves um, four children. Um, she's a widow, she has no spouse, and she leaves everything to her four children in equal shares. That is an extremely uh, straightforward type of will, um, not an issue in terms of probate. Yes, you have to go through the probate process after mother dies, but it's very straightforward. If there is a situation, again, there is so much material to cover, but I just want to point out certain things. If you have a situation where you are writing out, you are disinheriting, you're omitting one of the one of your family members, whether it's a child, but if it's a relative who would have stood to inherit under state law, um, then this is a situation where you might want to consider something other than a will. You might want to consider another document uh, through which you can name your beneficiary. So again, if mom has four kids, and unfortunately one of those kids she wants to disinherit, uh, either because uh, they've hurt her, that child has hurt her in a way that's irreparable, or because she has nothing to do with that child, she can't even locate them. That's a red flag. That would be a situation where you want to avoid probate because that type of probate will be difficult. Another example is if a person owns real property in more than one state. So even if you have it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the value of the estate. It more has to do with where the property is located. If you live in New York, you're domiciled in New York, but you have a small condo, uh, let's just say in California, or um, an apartment, a co-op, uh, not a co-op, I'm sorry, that's not a good example because a co-op is actually not real property. But if you have a home in Florida, anytime a person dies with real property in more than one state, uh, and when that person dies, probate has to be done in every single state where the property was located. So that could be a costly proposition for your kids. That would be another situation where you kind of want to avoid having a will. Okay, now we're going to go on to the next slide. Um, so I just mentioned uh, some of these things um, earlier on, but when you are doing a will, uh, you want to make sure that it was executed properly. Um, I can tell you that nine out of 10 times when a person goes on legal Zoom uh, to have their documents uh, prepared, you know, it's, it's basically a website that allows you to do all of this without really having to pay for an attorney. Very often, um, we find that things were not properly executed and that could cause a lot of problems so that ultimately 
The money you saved on legal by using legal zoom and not using an attorney ends up costing your family dearly. Um, an interwarring clause is an interesting clause that's just sometimes used in our planning. So mom who has four kids um, comes to me and basically says, you know, I'm leaving out one of my kids. And I say to her, you know what, mom, it's much better for you not to have a will. Uh, you should probably consider a trust, which I'm going to cover. But mom says, you know what? No, I really, I just want to go with something simple. I'm not going to be here. I don't really care. So what do I do? I, I suggest to mom, you know what? That child that you were going to leave out, maybe you want to just, um, maybe you want to just leave them something. Not one dollar, because one dollar is not going to do anything. But you might want to leave that child ten thousand dollars. Okay, so the other children get far more, but the child who you want to exclude, you leave him ten thousand dollars, and you say, "Okay, I'm leaving you ten thousand dollars." However, if you contest this will, you don't get anything. So that's a way to sometimes avoid a will contest to make the probate that much easier. But again, remember people say, oh, just leave a dollar. That doesn't help because nobody really cares uh, about uh, losing out on a dollar. It has to be an amount that the person is concerned about losing. So what I've talked about uh, situations where it's probably better to avoid doing a will and maybe uh, consider another document. And the document that I'm referring to is a, is a trust. Um, I've used this example numerous times with my clients because people have trouble understanding what a trust is, right? So again, a will is a document. I leave my doc, I leave my assets to my four kids in equal shares. I appoint somebody to carry out my wishes. It's a piece of paper or obviously several pieces of paper that are sealed together. That's a will. It's not a separate entity. It's a, it's a document. A trust, think about it, is like a separate entity. Consider an envelope when you when you visualize a trust. What I'm doing now is yes, my trust is going to have the same language as my will. I, Debbie Rosenfeld, leave my assets in equal shares to my children. But now the trust is a separate entity. So it's not enough that I have a document that's called a trust and leaves everything to my kids in equal shares. I actually have to physically take my assets and feed them into the envelope. The envelope or the, the envelope is the trust and it's governed by an agreement. And if I take these assets, namely, deed to my house, um, brokerage account, if I take my assets and I actually put them into, an, into the envelope, they are no longer in my name. So that when I die, there's nothing in my name. Remember I said at the very beginning, if you have a will, that means it's only going to apply to things that are in your name alone when you die. If I take my assets that are in my name and I retitle them, in the name of the Debbie Rosenfeld Trust, meaning, and I put them all into my envelope. When I die, there's nothing in my name. And therefore, no probate is necessary. And thankfully, we can process that person's uh, estate. We can transfer the assets into the trust to the various beneficiaries without the court involved, getting involved, without having to find anybody who's been disinherited, without having to do probate if there's real property in more than one state. So there are very often good reasons to do uh, trusts. Okay, next slide, Jackie. Okay. Um, before I go further into talking about trusts, because that is an excellent tool in the elder law planning um, arena, I just want to go back and expand a little bit on the power of attorney, which I discussed. Um, we are going to talk about elder law. Hopefully, I'll be able to focus on it for about 20 minutes in today's lecture and asset protection and how we get there. And again, these are just other documents that you need to have. Power of attorney, so yes, in a perfect world, clients come to me when they're healthy and they're vital. Um, and they say to me, you know what, Debbie, our main concern in coming in today is that we want to protect our assets in case we need long-term care. And I say, okay. And I talk to Mr. and Mrs. Smith about their various options, but the basic way to protect your assets 
for in terms of long-term care is to actually relinquish control of them. And so I come up with a plan that again, might, uh, might I, I'll encourage, I encourage my clients to have the power of attorney, the healthcare proxy, the living will. I also encourage them to have a last will and testament for any assets that they do have in their name. But ideally, the clients are at a point in their lives where they know what their monthly expenses are, they know what they need to live on. And I make a recommendation that they transfer their other assets into a certain type of trust that I'm going to elaborate on, okay? What does this have to do with power of attorney? That's in a perfect world. But very often, we deal with people who do not do planning. And I get it. I get it. People do not want to address their mortality. And people, when they're feeling good, it's hard to visualize a time that will be different. And these are painful things to anticipate. It's painful to think about what I'm going to do. How am I going to protect my assets when I become incapacitated? A lot of people don't want to think about it. So what's, if a person has a good, solid power of attorney, guess what? Even if you don't do any planning, and I'm not recommending this, I'm saying this is, again, we're talking in a perfect world. When people do planning in advance, we can protect most of a person's assets. But in an emergency, it's not like all is lost. In an emergency, the elder law field has come up with planning, again, depending on the situation, depending on a person's specific um, uh, specific. Uh, criteria depending on their the facts in their own life we can we can potentially protect a part of a person's uh, assets again it all depends so the point is but now the person is incapacitated but if they have a good power of attorney in place then that agent who's appointed on the power of attorney the person who signs the power of attorney is the principal the person who is appointed is the agent that agent and it can be more than one agent that agent can uh, act and do various planning at such point in time that um, assets can be protected now if you look at the bottom line of this slide a form poa is not good enough for estate or long-term care planning i can't impress this fact enough. I have been practicing in this field for 30 years, and I think I am not lying when I maintain that I have never seen a power of attorney that somebody printed or, you know, either on LegalZoom or from the New York State Bar Association. I have never seen one that has been sufficient to do emergency planning. So again, I am going to again say it, which means don't take a, a power of attorney from a title company. Don't print a, a power of attorney off the internet. In New York, we have a very, very specific form that comports with law. And as, power, as elder law attorneys, over the years, we have put in every imaginable power needed in a medical emergency. Again, the power of attorney is just for finances. The healthcare proxy will help with the medical part, but there are things that we can do in the last minute, in the last minute, but when a person is incapacitated and they don't have a power of attorney, our hands are tied. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to go for guardianship. So just to give you an idea, a power of attorney costs 850, guardianship costs about ten thousand dollars so you know again sometimes it, it it doesn't make sense to be penny wise and pound foolish next uh slide jackie okay we're gonna slip skip, uh, skip this slide because i already talked about this um okay so now we go to living trusts and Again, I want to go over some of the terminology so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. A living trust, what does that mean? You know, people will come to me and they'll say, I want an asset protection trust. Um, and somebody else will say, no, 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 I want a living trust. And somebody else will say, no, I want a revocable trust. Sometimes all of these phrases are all one in the same. A living trust, essentially, remember, we're talking about that envelope. Think of it as a third party where you're going to be putting your assets into an envelope. 
if you do this trust while you're alive, well, guess what? That's a living trust. That's what it means. It's a, a something that's created by the person who creates the trust, Debbie Rosenfeld, that's the grantor, also known as the settler or the creator. It's all the same person. The trustee is the person who carries out the wishes of the grantor. So if the grantor says, you know, let's make this simple. I create an envelope. Okay, that's my trust. I created for myself and I put my house into the trust. And my goal is to protect my house in case I ever need Medicaid in the future, right? When I talk about asset protection, Medicaid is the only governmental program out there that covers long-term care. So if I have no long-term care insurance and I don't want my house to ultimately go towards, be applied towards my care, one of the options I have is I put it in the trust. What is my trustee? My trustee can be one of my kids. They will carry out my wishes, meaning my trust is going to read very much like a will. And it's going to say, when I, Debbie Rosenfeld, pass away, I want my trust to pay. I want my house to pass to my four children. My four kids are the beneficiaries. And the trustee is the person who I appoint who will ultimately carry out my wishes. Can the trustee be one of the beneficiaries? Absolutely. Um, so as I've mentioned already, the trust will avoid probate. Now, meaning any asset in that trust does not have to go through the probate process. Even if I have a will, the will with respect to that asset will be, um, will be, irrelevant because the asset is held by the trust. Now, the type of trust that I am talking about right now, it's a living trust, but, but for purposes of the elder law arena, there are different kinds of trust. The kind of trust that's used for asset protection, it's a living trust, it's referred to as irrevocable. Right now, let's think about that. What does that mean? It means I, Debbie Rosenfeld, I put my house into a trust and for all intents and purposes, I put my house into that envelope. I, I retitled the deed in the name of the Debbie Rosenfeld Irrevocable Trust. Guess what? That trust, that envelope is sealed. I'm doing this to protect my house in case I need Medicaid. Right now, if Medicaid saw a trust that says Debbie Rosenfeld can put her house into the trust, but she can also take it out. She can use it for whatever she wants. She can sell it. She can use it to buy another house. If Medicaid sees that I have control over that trust, Medicaid's going to say, Debbie, that house is yours. And so for purposes of Medicaid, it will be considered an available asset. So the trust that I need to utilize in the context of Medicaid planning, meaning elder law, I'm trying to protect it, that trust has to be considered irrev irrevocable. Look at the bottom line of this slide. Be aware. No principle of the trust can go to grantor. Now, guess what? The beauty of putting a house into the trust, you don't feel much of a difference. Even though it says no principle of the trust can go to grantor, what is the principle? The principle is my house. There's no liquidity when you just put a house into a trust. And the terms of the trust can say that I, Debbie Rosenfeld, have the right to live there. The beauty of that is that I will continue to pay all the bills, including the real estate taxes. My beneficiaries, my kids, my trustee, one of my children, doesn't have to worry. All of a sudden, it's not like the house is in their name and they have to pay all the bills. Very little changes. If my, uh, if I need to sell that house during my lifetime, guess what? I tell the trustee, you know what? The time has come. I need to sell the, the house. All that trustee has to do is show up at a closing. The trustee has to show up and basically the proceeds from the sale of my house go right back into the trust and are protected and can be used to purchase another replacement property. And that replacement property, again, will, will be protected. How does this all, how does this all uh, work? How does it jive with taxes? So first of all, let's just say I put my house in this envelope. The envelope is sealed, it's an irrevocable trust, and I never, I never sell my house during my lifetime. The beauty is, I'm treated as uh, no differently than if that house had remained in my name, meaning 
Let's just say I paid 200,000 for that house and now it's worth 500,000. My kids get a step up in basis when I die. And that means when they go out and sell, sell that house, the basis is no longer 200,000 or whatever the number I said, it's whatever the value is when I die and therefore no capital gains taxes. Now, what if I sell the house conversely, okay? I wanna sell the house during my lifetime. Again, I'm going to reiterate, based on how we draft this irrevocable trust, even though Medicaid is satisfied, that trust, that house is no longer in my name, from a capital gains point of view, if that house was in my name and was my primary residence, I could offset any gain by 250,000. So if I sold the house, if I bought the house for 250 and I sold it for 500, I'm not gonna have any gains, capital gains tax because I can subtract that gain by 250,000. So the good news is if we put the house into an irrevocable trust and it's sold, I still have that $250,000 capital gains tax exclusion. And so by the way, I just need you to know, this is not magic. This is based on how we draft the trust. Not every trust out there is drafted properly, but we try to keep in mind, we try to balance our client's needs. On the one hand, we want to protect the house so that if God forbid the person needs Medicaid, Medicaid will be available, okay? By this, so we have to have certain language in there, namely no principal of the trust can go to the grantor. By the same token, we don't want this to be a taxable disaster. So we put other language in the trust that makes sure that from a capital gains tax point of view, the person will get beneficial treatment either when they die or when they sell, when the, if the house is sold during their lifetime. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, I just want to note briefly, I won't dwell on this. Um, you know, I mentioned COVID causing all kinds of problem problems, you know, in the context of prior to COVID, no matter how elderly or frail the person was, we would have to sign, they would have to sign in our presence because most of these, many of these documents require notarized signatures. Um, we are all notary publics or most of us in the office. So meeting face-to-face -face was very important. COVID uh, created a situation where meeting face-to-face -face was often impossible. So thankfully the governor's um, office, Governor Cuomo has had these executive orders and they keep, they're only um, valid for 30 days. But the beauty is that provided that we do comport with some of the, um, you know, if we comply, I'm sorry, with some of the rules, namely we have to be able to see the client sign. So we do that via Zoom or via, um, uh, you know, the iPhone. Um, and so that if we're able, as long as we're able to see uh, FaceTime or Zoom, or, you know, we've even unfortunately had situations where we will go out to a person's home and do the signing outside if these things are impossible. But my point is we're able to notarize remotely and that's made life easier for a lot of our clients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the virtual execution of documents has been extended through March 16th. It is likely to continue um, and to be extended every month. Um, as long as this pandemic is in existence, there are many people who still, as we know, do not have vaccines and are terrified to go outside. So we are able to do this and that's what our office has been doing. Um, okay, Jackie, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip the will contest because I would like to talk about um, options for long term care. OK, now um, I just want to briefly talk about, um, you know, I said the estate planning attorney does these documents, but the elder law attorney also uh, uh, takes into account people's concerns about long term care and how they're going to pay for it. So just to give you an overview of what I mean. Somebody comes to me and they have a house and about a million dollars in assets, let's just say. And it's very nice, you know, again, very uh, friendly type of situation where they want to leave everything, husband and wife, they want to leave everything to each other and then to their children. And that's fine. I could do lovely wills for them. We don't have to worry about trusts because there's no concern about a will contest or having to do probate in more than one state. 
And, you know, and I know, I know to myself, a million dollars in a brokerage account plus a house, that's a lot of money. Um, sadly, however, in the long-term care arena, that is not so much money, um, meaning that money could be spent very, very easily um, and very quickly. Just to give you an idea, this slide really tells you a home, an hourly, a home health attendant can run anywhere from $25 to $35 an hour. Um, and to have live-in care, because even um, live-in care is basically 24-7 care, that could run as high as $400 a day. Again, these are not scare tactics, but it's giving you an idea of how quickly you could go through that kind of money. Um, an assisted living uh, unit or a memory care unit could be anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000. And the reason why it's so high is because in the assisted living facility, um, there's just, you can live independently, but if you need, if you run into memory issues or you need help with some activities of daily living, you have to pay for an aid in addition to the cost of the assisted living facility. And that's why it could go as high as 20,000 a month. And nursing home care, which is, you know, obviously the, the last choice, the least desirable choice, can run anywhere from 15 to $25,000 a month. So um, Jackie, next slide. When we talk about long-term care, um, there are different options. Um, I would say uh, private pay is the least desirable option. And the only time I will tell a person, you know, private pay makes the most sense is somebody who has so much money that their income, the income generated from this, the income alone is enough to cover the cost of this type of care without having to dip into principal. And in that case, the person, you know, might just decide, but, you know, very often those very same people will also have long-term care insurance. Um, so we're talking about the very, very wealthy. Um, and the reason why most people do not have long-term care insurance is because it is so costly and so expensive and so unaffordable. And you should just know, yes, people who procured policies 20 years ago, and some of those companies have gone out of business, but some of those policies are so amazingly outrageous in terms of their coverage. They're not issuing policies like that anymore. So even the people who I meet who have long-term care insurance, often when we run the numbers, it's not enough. And so they have to also engage in some other type of plan. So essentially, um, so far I've said, private pay is one way that people pay. Long-term care insurance is another pay. Medicare, other than the first 100 days in a, a long-term care facility for purposes of covering, and it's a maximum of 100 days. Most people do not get 100 days, um, but you know, people who need some type of rehab and qualify, Medicare will pay initially, but it's very often, most often, will not cover all of a person's long-term care expenses. Um, veterans' benefits are another uh, avenue. Um, uh, aid in attendance um, is something that is available and they have changed the rules. It used to be that you could transfer your assets because there isn't an asset limitation. It used to be $80,000 and it's gone up, um, but aid in attendance now has a three-year look back period. So it's actually watered down um, a lot of the benefits that a person is eligible for. And I would say, unfortunately, the best type of veterans benefits um, available are for people who have been, you know, who have a disability that is related, uh, that is predominantly, you know, it's not just 40% or 50%, but anybody who has a disability that's related to their service uh, can get significant ven veterans benefits. Other than that, it might, uh, you know, it might provide some aid, but it's certainly not gonna cover everything entirely. Um, now, so again, just to summarize, it's private pay. Nobody really wants to do that um, or nobody relishes that unless the very, very wealthy, then it makes sense. Uh, Long-term care insurance um, and spousal liability is a situation, you know, it basically says one spouse is liable for um, the cost of uh, the other spouse's long-term care. Again, you know, in the Medicaid arena, what we do is we uh, invoke spousal refusal where the spousal says, I refuse to do that. So these are just um, 
um, different uh, avenues to cover the cost of expense, but it's not something that we typically rely on. But Medicaid is what many, many people resort to. It's really the only governmental program out there that in fact covers uh, the cost of long-term care. And you should know Medicaid is a federally funded program, it's a federal program, but all states have to contribute their own component, their own um, uh, dollar amount. So every state is different. And the reason why this is important to know, I can't tell you, you know, again, I, I do have thankfully a lot of experience. I have people who come to me and sometimes a little bit of, edu of, of education is not a good thing. People go online and they read an article and it might tell them there's no such thing as home care. You're not eligible, you know, or, or no home care in the Medicaid arena. That is because certain states do not have a home care program. So you have to be very careful about your research. Even though Medicaid is a federal program, every state is different. And what's nice to know is that New York State happens to have one of the most liberal Medicaid programs in the country. We have both a home care program and a, you know, a, an assisted living facility program and a nursing home program. Uh, next slide, Jackie, please. Okay, now the laws, I am just gonna gloss over this, not because it's not important, but because we don't have that much time. Okay, so now Medicaid again, I just mentioned, it's important to know, all you need to know, all you need to walk away from with from this uh, presentation is that New York does have a home care program. And I would say till about two, three years ago, it was very, very generous. Now we have to work harder in order to get people the care that they need. Uh, the law recently changed, actually it changed during COVID, surprising to many of us. Um, basically it, it, it's effective for applicants, applications after October 2nd, but I am going to, after October 1st, I'm sorry, but I am going to note something about that. Um, basically, it's affected, it used to be that when you applied for home care, there was no look back period. So the example I gave, a million dollars in a brokerage account and a house, obviously other things have to be taken into account, but you could conceivably transfer those assets out of your name and be eligible for home care in the very next month. As of October 1st, 2020, there will be a two and a half year look back period. So that's the first major change. However, that look back period has been pushed off. First, it was initially pushed off till April 1st. Again, would, would apply to all transfers made after October 1st, 2020. But now there is talk that it's going to absolutely be pushed off again till July 1st. So that's something you need to know. So in other words, if there is somebody out there, either amongst my listeners or somebody you know who needs home care, as long as that application is submitted, again, I don't want to say definitively, right now I know April 1st, but again, there's fairly there, it's fairly definitive that it will be pushed off till July 1st. So as long as the application is, is submitted prior to that date, even if transfers are made now, there won't be any look back period. Um, it's also the way the application is also being handled in terms of care is that it used to be that you needed help. It used to be that you just needed to need help with two activities of daily living. Now that is being pushed, that is being changed and you need more than two activities of daily living. So that um, you need to, you need to show that you need help with three activities of daily living. And the other thing is there used to be a level, a level one housekeeping um, that, you know, where basically was for a person who was frail, didn't necessarily need help with activities of daily living, but needed some, um, some help around the house, some help with cleaning. That was considered housekeeping assistance of up to eight hours a week. So that's been uh, done away with, unfortunately. Um, Jackie, next slide. Okay, so this is something I just touched upon, and I'm wondering um, if I should just take time now and try to address uh, 
the questions that were posed to me before I go any further. So maybe I will do that because we only have a few more minutes. So I just want to summarize. I did have more to say. I just, if I could just say, uh, please focus on the five documents that I mentioned, uh, namely power of attorney, healthcare proxy, and living will, as long as the last will and testament and a trust. That's something that every person needs with a strong stress on power of attorney. I also didn't mention that the power of attorney law is actually changing. Um, legislation passed and a new form will be in place as of uh, June. And um, it's no longer going to have a separate gift rider. And it's, it's basically been um, effectuated to try to address some of the concerns that people had, uh, namely that um, a lot of financial institutions, even though it was a statutory form, a lot of the financial institutions are not addressing it. So basically, remember power of attorney, but if you do one now, it will still be grandfathered. It will be fine. So you don't have to worry about waiting until June to have a power of attorney. And finally, remember that an irrevocable trust is an excellent way to protect assets in anticipation of potential long-term care needs in the future. Putting your assets into the trust is a wonderful way, A, of protecting them, but still retaining some element of control and not being hit with any negative uh, tax consequences. So um, I, again, I have so much more to say, but I think I would like to address some of the questions. Um, and if it's okay, I'm gonna address them openly um, and try to cover as much as I can. And as Shane has said in the beginning, if any of you have more, um, if any of you have more questions, you can reach out to Shane and she'll get them to me. Um, first question: Do the costs of probate come out of the estate, or is it possible that the person inheriting an asset has to pay for probate costs? The probate costs should come out of the estate, but think about that question. If you are the beneficiary, let's say I am the daughter and dad passes away and I'm the sole beneficiary, even though the costs come out of the estate, it's ultimately eating into my pocket. It's less for the beneficiary to have. Okay, um, what happens if you own property outside of the estate? If you own property outside of the United States, I'm sorry, uh, typically that requires another, um, another uh, probate in that particular country. And it's very hard to avoid that. Like, so for example, I have a lot of clients, uh, let's say who um, also have property in Europe. If the particular country does not recognize trusts, there's very little I can do for that client or that family. Either that client can go through the process of transferring the property while they're alive, but if they pass away, then a probate would have to be initiated in that country. Um, do you have info resources for helping people with low income to do this planning properly? Um, I'm a social worker and I have a lot of people I work with that need this, but are very limited financially. So um, um, the answer is yes, um, we do have resources. We can help people, but also I, I, I do hate to say this. I don't want to sound elitist. If a person does not have a lot of assets and they have very low income, then yes, they can avail themselves of the Medicaid and not of Medicaid and not much planning is required if there's no assets to protect. So there is, I wanna differentiate between low income. Low income people might also have assets and it still behooves us to protect them. Um, so we do have resources. We can send people in the right direction. And even when people have low income, if they do have an asset to protect, they should that should be addressed. Um, if other assets are not prop that are not prop property go into a trust, do you have access to the answer to the assets? Again, it depends upon the trust. But if it's a trust that I've discussed. Um, that is for purposes of protecting assets, then the access that a person can have, remember, Medicaid wants to see that you've relinquished control of your asset. If you have power and control over those assets, then Medicaid will deem that asset to be available. So the answer, my quick answer is that the asset, assets, the access that you have is limited. What we can do is allow for um, 
the income to be available. So again, if I put $200,000 into an irrevocable trust and I want it to satisfy Medicaid, I can't have access to the 200,000, but I can have access, the income that the 200,000 earns can be paid to me. Uh, what is the cost of a trust? That really depends on the type of trust and it could run anywhere from about, again, it's our firm and every place is different, anywhere from about 3,500 to about uh, 4,700, depending on the type of trust. And it's a flat fee, one-time fee covers all questions um, and as much time as the person needs. Is putting assets in a trust considered a transfer of assets for Medicaid? A hundred percent, and that's an excellent question. Meaning if you transfer assets to a trust, you have to wait five years before there will be Medicaid eligibility for nursing home purposes and two and a half years for home care purposes. How would the grantor access funds of a brokerage account? The, the way the grantor access, accesses funds in an irrevocable trust is through the trustee and the trustee, the only assets that the trustee can, the only access the trustee can give is to, um, I'm sorry, is to, is in, in terms of income. Whatever you put into a trust, you have to recognize that you are relinquishing control. And that's why you meet with an attorney. So we go over what should actually be in the trust and what should actually remain um, outside the trust, okay? Um, let's see if I can do any more, I guess, Shana, just stop me when I'm going over time. Um, okay. I think I've run out of time. And so whoever else, um, I think Jackie indicated that the slides will be available for, um, uh, for anybody who is interested, but any other questions, I guess, uh, you're going to have to reach out, uh, to Shane and I'll be happy to answer them individually. Yes, thank you, Debbie. Um, any additional question, you can send it to me and then I will definitely send it to um, Jackie and Indica. she can answer most of the questions. Um, thank you again, that was great. Um, and then the, the slide, if you email, I think Jackie put the email on the-, on the I put it in the chat. Yes. jrothermel at fatulalaw.com. Um, I put in um, the phone number as well. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like a copy of the slides, I'd be happy to send them to you as well. Since you have my email, if you have a question for Ms. Rosenfeld, I will forward it to her directly. Um, so between Shana and I, we'll get your questions answered. I think we can go to another five minutes to answer the, the rest of the question. If you have time, Debbie, do you? Sure, I do. I have five minutes. Absolutely. Okay, okay let's do so the let five. Let me go back to... Um, let me go back to where I was at. Um, okay. I was up to a question. My sister and brother-in-law do not have children and have considerable assets. They have put it, uh, put off wish, putting their wishes in writing and subsequently have no POA or anything. What happens in the case where either one passes away? Okay. So now this is, um, not, not a Medicaid question, but in that case, their assets would get distributed if they have no will and they have nothing in place and one of them dies, okay? Anything joint goes to the other person automatically. So, but let's say sister and brother-in-law have assets that are held separately, Stay, they still have to go to court. It's not a probate process, but it's an administration process and it's, it's also costly because you need to retain an attorney typically. Uh, the law dictates that if a husband or wife dies without children, everything passes to the surviving spouse. After they're both gone, state law will again dictate how the assets get distributed. So we'd probably have to get a genealogist involved because the law dictates, first it goes to spouse and children, if you have no spouse, then all to children. If you have no children, then all to parents. If you have, if, meaning when I say have no parents, if your parents are deceased, then to siblings. And if siblings are deceased, then to their children. So the law does provide for how these assets get distributed and it is in accordance, and, and, but it does have to go through court. Um, is the spousal liability for long-term care expenses nationwide or does it vary by state? 
Spousal refusal is not available in every state, meaning when I say spousal refusal, I, Debbie Rosenfeld, file something that I refuse to pay for my husband's medical expenses. And in that specific state, husband can put all the assets into wife's name and husband is then eligible for Medicaid and wife, as I said, signs something called spouse refusal. That is not available in every state. So the answer is no, it depends on um, uh, wh why, uh, uh, you know, it depends on where you live. Uh, somebody wrote in, I'm interested in the slide about reasons a will can be contested. Um, so again, one situation, I mean, uh, we will send you the slide, but one situation is uh, where somebody is written out. So let's just say I have, this is another point that's important. Let's just say a person has three kids, okay? Uh, they leave out, they specifically write for reasons that are known to them, I leave out my sister. That sister has no standing to contest a will because state law says if mom dies without a husband, she, uh, everything goes to the children. So that you only can contest a will if you have standing. And therefore you only have to avoid probate if a person who has standing, that person is referred to as a distributee. For example, one of the children, that person would have to that person would have standing and they could contest the will. Um, so again, it's when a person who would have been able to inherit if there were no will, if they are left out, then uh, they, the will can be contested. Um, if all assets are placed in an irrevocable trust, how does the grantor meet daily and life lifestyle costs? Now that's a great question. I never recommend that all assets be placed in a trust. So first of all, actually that's not true. Um, let, we're not talking, this trust only holds assets. So again, many, many elderly people live on their monthly income, which could be social security, pension, and also income derived from their investment assets. So if all of those assets are put into a trust, the person can still meet his daily and lifestyle costs because he or she is still gonna have the income coming in every month. So that's how, and let's just say the person doesn't have enough. Let's just say my income is only $1,000 and my monthly expenses are 3,000. Well, in that case, I'm not gonna advise that the person put all their savings into a trust. Um, I might recommend hold on to your savings, but just put your house into a trust. So again, it depends on uh, the specific instances. Um, did I answer all? No, I didn't. Okay. Why co-op does not consider, a co-op is considered an asset. I'm sorry if I was unclear. A co-op is not considered real property because a co-op is a home, but the ownership of the co-op is reflected through a stock certificate allowing you, giving you ownership in the build, in the co-op corporation, plus a proprietary lease that says, due to my ownership of this stock, I'm allowed to live in this apartment. So it's not considered real property legally. It's absolutely an asset. And we absolutely, uh, we do this every day. We transfer co-ops into trusts, just like we do deeds. That's the, the next question. However, the only thing with a co-op is you are, unlike a deed, where I could just retitle a deed in my irrevocable trust, unlike that, a co-op, you have to get approval from the co-op board, and you have to issue, and they have to issue a new stock certificate in the name of the trust. My point being, it just takes a little longer and is a little more costly. Um, do you have to have a person's social security to name them as a beneficiary of a will? The answer is no. Um, who has standing after spouse, kids, parents, siblings? Um, so it's spouse and kids. Then if there's no spouse, then it's kids. If there are parents, then after siblings are nieces and nephews. So if a sibling has predeceased their niece and nephew, and then it would be great niece and nephew. So, and it goes on and on. Um, what about out of state nieces, nephews, and their children? It doesn't matter whether a person lives out of state or not. If Let's just say I pass away and I have no children, I have no spouse, you know, God forbid, I have no living parents and my sister has predeceased me. It doesn't matter whether my niece and nephew live out of state or not. 
if they are my, they're considered my distributees, everybody else has passed away. It doesn't matter whether they live in Africa. It doesn't matter whether they live in Florida or if they live in New York, they are considered my distributees and they are entitled to my estate if I don't have a will. And if I do have a will naming other people, they are entitled um, to, to uh, they, they have standing, meaning they would be entitled to contest my will. The last case in, case, in the case of my death, my death and don't know, oh, 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 that's just a continuation. If you have out of state nieces and nephews and you don't know any of them, again, if they are your closest kin, it doesn't matter. They still have to get notice and the probate of that type of will would be difficult. Okay, I think I answered all the questions. I think I spoke faster and faster, so I apologize. <laughs> that's okay. But yeah, you, you got all the questions. And if any additional question, you can reach out to us. Um, Debbie, that was great. Thank you again. And thank okay, you, everybody. Okay, I'm sorry to everybody if I spoke too quickly, but I no, just have so fast. much material to cover. It was fast. And then um, if you miss any part of it, Jackie can share the, the slides with you. Okay, um, thank you again. Hi, Eileen. Thank you again, everybody. Um, thank you, Debbie. And oh, I'll you're see so all welcome. Of you. Thank you, everybody. And I see all of Take you care. next week, Wednesday. Bye-bye now.